Hello all. So in this particular video, I'm going to discuss with you on the topic neoclassical criticism, the English neoclassical criticism. So this particular video is, but is meant to give you an idea on this particular topic. And in the subsequent video lectures, I'll be discussing about the various English neoclassical critics. So the critics that we are going to discuss in the subsequent videos include John Dryden, after which we'll be discussing about Dr. Johnson. And finally, we will be discussing about Alexander Pop, the famous English neoclassical critic. So let's get started with an introduction on the neoclassical criticism. So to begin with, uh, I think you're all familiar with the word criticism. Now, criticism is something that is very important in the society. It is, after all, an integral part of the society, which lets the society know or get to know about certain things and finally build something for a betterment. So criticism is essentially something which has to be taken very positive and it leads to some betterment in the society. So I hope you know what it means by the term literary criticism. So criticism on literary works is called as literary criticism. Now, just as the literary history of England has these various classifications, such as the Shakespearean era, or uh, let's say the neoclassical era, just like that, in English criticism too, we have these different phases based on the years or based on the centuries. Now, neoclassical criticism can be situated historically along with the accession of King Charles II into the throne. So you have all heard of King Charles II, who was the son, who is the son of the beheaded King Charles I. King Charles I spent a considerable time of his earlier phases of his life in Paris, France. And as you know, Paris is a cultural center as far as Europe is concerned. And hence, this cultural milieu in Paris influenced Charles II. And eventually, when Charles II moved to London to become the king of England, he prophesied these cultural values which he had imbibed during his life in Paris, France. Now, uh, it is along with the reign of King Charles II that we can associate the term English neoclassical criticism. Now, so that goes with the historical background of this particular area called neoclassical criticism. So when we, when we discuss about the neoclassical criticism, invariably we'll have to discuss about the historical context and the historical context is already set. That is, it is by, it it is associated with the rule of King Charles II. So now, now let's discuss about the philosophical background of neoclassical criticism, which we are all interested in, right? The philosophical backgrounds of neoclassical criticism. But before moving on to the, uh, the philosophical context, let me share you a slide which I have prepared. Give me a, uh, a few seconds to start it. Okay, so there you go. So this is the uh, discussions, uh, the thoughts which I would like to discuss with you on neoclassical criticism. So as uh, discussed uh, already, we had discussed the point number one, the historical background, moving to the point number two, philosophical background. The English neoclassical critical tradition reiterated the classical tradition and is similar in strains to the French and Italian neoclassical criticism. So as you can look at this particular title neoclassical so 
classical in the Western context is something that is associated with the preachings, the teachings, the ideals, the cultural milieu, and the efflorescence of art and literature, which took place in the ancient Greco-Roman civilization. All right. So that is what is usually associated with the term classical from a Western context. Now, neoclassical. So what do you mean by neoclassical? By the term neoclassical, what is meant is a literal continuation or a just uh, a, a mere continuation of the ancient classical ideals. So this is exactly what is meant by neoclassical. So when we say that Dryden is a neoclassical writer, what we mean is that John Dryden is well read on the classical literature, on the Greco-Roman civilization, the art of writing poetry and the art of writing literature, which and the set of norms and rules uh, which were propounded by the ancient Greco-Roman philosophers and poets and thinkers. So, all right. So, let's move into the philosophical background of the English neoclassical criticism. As I had already read out, English neoclassical criticism is a reiteration and is very much in sync, or it is very much similar to that of the French and Italian neoclassical criticism. Mind you, I already told you, it was Charles II who reigned during the neoclassical uh, period in England, and he had spent a considerable amount of his early childhood and early teenage in Paris. And it was a time when neoclassicism was in great vogue in France during the time. And no wonder he brought in those neoclassical ideals into England too and tried to reestablish it. So English neoclassicism is a phenomenon which is actually a kind of ditto, which is in fact a kind of copying of the fashion which existed in France as well as in Italy during those times. Now, if you really want to understand English neoclassicism, classical criticism, we will have to contrast it with the German neoclassical criticism, because uh, unlike the French, Italian, and the English neoclassical criticisms, the German neoclassical criticism was a bit different. In Germany, during the neoclassical uh, tradition, there happened a complete breakaway from the ancient Greco-Roman ideals. But the French, the Italian, and the English neoclassical criticism is a sort of continuation of the Greco-Roman ideals. I hope my point, I hope the, uh, the idea is very clear over here. Now, let's move into some of the major features of neoclassical criticism. So the some of the major features, some of the catchwords that is associated with the neoclassical criticism include clarity, newness, and the laws of nature. So the if you take the case of neoclassical poetry, the exact words, the precise words are used. So that is what is meant by clarity, newness, laws of nature. They followed rules and uh, and ideals which governed in the writing of a drama, in the preparation of poetry, in the preparation of any sort of literature, rules and laws are very important. Now, simultaneously, along with the neoclassical era, the neoclassical era in England is also an era which witnessed the scientific growth in England. It was also the time of Newton. So science, as you know, science is based on empiricism, observation, collection of data. And from that, real facts are used in science. So neoclassical criticism too import gives importance to the reality, the clarity, the newness. I hope you can equate these ideas. Now, let's move down. Here is a quote by 
from Alexander Pope from his essay on criticism. I already, I had you already know that Alexander Pope is a neoclassical critic, and in his essay on criticism, we have these wonderful lines. And what does Alexander Pope tell us about neoclassical criticism? Let us see. What oft was thought, but never so well expressed. So what oft was thought. So thoughts are very important in poetry. You name it in literature. Whichever art, thought is very important. So neoclassical critics believed that thoughts are very central to the creation of literature, and it has to be expressed very clearly. It has to be well expressed. That is, the choicest of the words has to be used, the rules that have to be used has to be employed, the syntax has to be correct, the grammar has to be correct, everything has to be perfect. So in short, um, the neoclassical criticism is based on norms, rules perfection of ideals okay so it is clarity okay and it is based on ideals right now let's uh move down to some other points that are noted over here let me read and then explain the english Renaissance criticism was a mere rereading of Greco Roman classics, while the English neoclassical criticism drew heavily from French and Italian neoclassicism, especially the thoughts of Pierre Corneille and Nicolas Bolu. So, I already told you that the English neoclassical criticism was seriously influenced by the French neoclassical criticism. According to the French neoclassical critics, um, the French neoclassical critics, such as Pierre Corneille, Nicolas Bolu, they had opined that. Uh, According to them, neoclassical criticism is a rereading. Okay, it is just a restudying of the uh, Greco Roman classics and Greco Roman norms and rules that governs literature. So, not only really that, they try to perfect them. Did you understand? Okay, so this is exactly what is described over here. So, the thoughts uh, that were governing the English neoclassical critics were that they tried to study, read, and analyze the classical work more and more. I hope you can understand. So all these writers, John Dryden, Alexander Pope, Dr. Johnson, they were so erudite. They were scholarly. They were scholars in classical literature. They were widely read and they tried to understand, analyze the classical literature, the art forms and the rules and norms that were governing it. So you might have also heard about the Renaissance. So uh, Renaissance, the very word Renaissance means restudying or studying the classical literature. So how do we differentiate Renaissance from neoclassical, which is an oft caught a doubt that many of us have. Renaissance is a studying, it is, it, it is an era which witnessed England getting introduced to the classical literature. On the other hand, neoclassical criticism and neoclassical era witnessed a revisitation of the classical literature as well as a restudy as well as an analysis of it and an application of it i hope you get get the point okay so neoclassical criticism is more intense when compared with the renaissance era renaissance is an era when the thinkers when the writers when the people got introduced into the art forms, into the thoughts of the ancient Greco-Romans. But 
English, the neoclassical era witnessed a much more closeness with the classical literature because the authors went into deeper analysis of the, of the classical literature and they were more close with classical literature. So that is what is meant over here. And moreover, in, uh, in order to define the English neoclassical criticism, we will have to say that the English neoclassical criticism was greatly influenced by the ideals of French neoclassical critics, such as Pierre Corneille and Nicolas Beaulieu. Okay, now, what did Pierre Corneille say? Here is a here is here are some points. According to him, the classical precepts should not be merely copied, and instead it should be set in tone to the temperament of the age. Pierre Corneille was a liberalist. He was a humanist, and according to him, he did not want a blind copying of the rules that governed the classical literature. The, the, he did not want a blind following of the Greco-Roman art and literature and norms. Instead of that, he wanted the scholars, the thinkers, and the readers to read the classical literature, find out and identify the best of the ideals, and then make certain changes and apply it in the form of writings so that society could benefit out of it. So this is what Cornell said. So I hope my point is clear. If you have doubt, you can rewind my dialogue and just listen to it and comprehend it. Now, the second French neoclassical critic who greatly influenced the English society was Beaulieu. So what did he say? Beaulieu called forth a move away from saintly and scripture-based medieval Christianity to secularist ideals and non-scriptural text and non-secular criticism. So according to Beaulieu, Beaulieu was a secularist. Now, as a secularist, I hope you're well aware of the word secular. As a secularist, Beaulieu wanted to... Um, mark a shift of literature away from the religiosity. He wanted to sever literature itself from religiosity, especially from Christianity and the Holy Bible. Okay, And he wanted to mark a shift away from the scriptures and uh, convert literature to something that is useful to the society. So this is exactly what Greco-Roman literature too did. So Greco-Roman literature was never religious. Instead of that, it was written, it was propagated, it was analyzed largely for its societal concerns. So literature is something that creates awareness. Literature is a tool for societal awareness. This is an ideal which Bolu finds uh, itself inherent in the classical literature. And this is what he tries to propagate. He is telling the French writers to separate themselves from the, from the religious scriptures. Uh, uh, he finds that the French literature or any literature in the Europe then times was associated with the church. So he wanted the writers to sever them, sever their writings from the church and the religiosity and instead focus on the general good and well-being of the society. Okay, so I hope you can understand it. So the uh, literature as a tool of reformation, as a tool of societal good, of, uh, as a tool for creating societal good was in fact an ideal that can be found in classical literature. And he takes this idea and he wants every writer to be to have the secular idea of severing themselves from religion and writing for the um, common good of the mankind. All right. Now, uh, so um, all these ideals, 
that is the ideals of Perry Corneille, the ideals of Beaulieu, and in general, the classical ideals, all these influenced the English neoclassical critics. All right. Now, I hope you are understanding, even though there are the ideas are very dense, I hope you can rewind it and listen to it and gain a much better comprehension. Now, uh, now um, let's make a comparison of the neoclassical era, um, the English neoclassical era, with that of the classical era or in the ancient Roman times. So you have all heard about the King Augustus, the Emperor Augustus of Rome. Now, it was uh, the generally that the word classical literature is often associated with Emperor Augustus. And in the English neoclassical criticism, you have this monarch, King Charles II. So let's make a comparison between King Augustus, Emperor Augustus, and King Charles II. So uh, here are some points. Let's move into that. Monarchy moved from the divinity of kings to secularism. So if you observe both these kings, you will understand that both of these kings never boasted about the divinity of kings. So what is divinity of kings? Divinity of kings is associated with the thought that kings are blue, um, they are royal blooded, and, uh, you know, they um, are genuinely gifted by the gods to rule upon the human beings, to usher in the right righteousness and virtuosity upon the society. So this is what governs the, the ideal of divinity of kings. So under these, the rule of both of these uh, kings, that is King Charles II in the English neoclassical criticism, as well as a great king emperor, Augustus, um, during the classical era, um, there was this general thought by the king that what is more important is secularism. That is, they tried to propagate an idea that everyone is to be treated equally. Okay. And king is just an ordinary man. And it is this ideal which made them uh, propagate art and literature and uh, let me explain it further. There was a move to secular human heroes of greco roman times than on divine beings. So during the reign of both these kings, um, if you take art and generally literature, uh, literature in, uh, in especially tried to propagate the secular ideals. They tried to celebrate the people, the general population, the general people, rather than celebrating religious heroes, okay? Like they did not like to celebrate certain saints or anything like that, or the Pope or the saints or the clergy, okay? So, so these are the two defining features of King Charles, Emperor Charles, Emperor Augustus, as well as King Charles II. All right. Now, these ideals, they gave a perfect fertile ground for neoclassical liberal ideals to grow. Okay, so this is just a comparison. Now, now let's go into uh, a conclusion of neoclassical criticism. The neoclassical criticism, let me rewind. It is based on perfection. It is based on ideals. It is based on clarity of thought. It is based on perfection and ideals. It is, in fact, a revisitation of the classics and uh, analysis and in-depth study of the classics. But they did not blindly follow the classical norms. They revised it. Neoclassical criticism tried to revise the classical norms and uh, conventions. So, uh, and the, moreover, uh, the, the English neoclassical criticism took great ideals from the classical ideals. That is, the classical literature never adhered to Christian thoughts or any religious thoughts. Instead, they were more secular. 
So it is this ideal of secularism that you find in neoclassical criticism. So these are some of the points that we must keep in mind in general when we think about neoclassical criticism. Now, finally, to touch upon, to finish, um, let us also look into the role of a critic according to neoclassical critics. So here we go. Criticism till then was seen as an actively devoid activity devoid of aesthetics and was in a lower pedestal. So criticism till then, uh, no, it was treated as secondary to writing of literature, but it was with the coming of the neoclassicist that there was a general understanding that criticism is something that requires a lot of thought and intellect, and it was gaining momentum. Criticism itself uh, got, uh, you know, uh, got a strong base. It started evolving into a separate area of, of which is capable of standing by its own with its own footage. Okay, criticism got its own tag during this particular era. Till then, criticism was always treated as secondary to the literature. Now, um, um, now let's uh, look into some of the ideals. Now, Alexander Pope, who was a, who was a neoclassical critic, he has defined a critic as those born to judge as well as born to write. So uh, according to Alexander Pope, a critic is, you know, is so talented because a critic can judge as well as a critic has got all the quality to write. So no wonder if you look at any of these critics, John Dryden, he was a poet, dramatist, as well as a critic. Now, if you look at Johnson, Dr. Johnson, he was a lexicographer. He was a scholar who was a great appreciator of poetry at the same time he was a critic similar is the case with alexander pope alexander pope was a poet a dramatist at the same time as a writer at the same time he was a critic so they according to all these neoclassical critics if you want to be a good poet you will have to be also be a good cr critic okay so it's generally fixed the role of a critic Okay, now let's look at the functions of a critic according to uh, the neoclassicism. It was in fact the neoclassical era which defined what is the role of a critic. Till then, critic was never accepted in the society, but it was by the neoclassical era that a critic's position was accepted. Now let's see who is a critic. Critic is... Uh, somebody who can who is able to estimate the worth of a literary work okay somebody who is to analyze capable of analyzing a literary work who specializes in fault finding who is able to look close by and find out faults in poetry or drama or whatever kind of writing it is criticism became a noble endeavor as creative as crafting a poem so uh, this is a point which we had already discussed. Criticism was, a critic was revered, respected, just like a poet was, just like a dramatist was. So this is the significance of uh, um, uh, neoclassical critic. So now we had already discussed all these uh, topics, um, which I had noted down under the heading neoclassical critic criticism. So um, I hope uh, you had benefited out of this uh, video lecture. And in the next uh, video lecture, we'll be continuing on to discuss with uh, John Dryden, after which there will be a separate lecture session on uh, Dr. Johnson. And finally, there will also be a separate lecture session on um, the criticism by Alexander Pope. So see you um, in the next video.